Awesome. Okay, let's get this thing kicked off. Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome. This is a huge deal for us at Tampa Devs because it is our one year anniversary of existing and hosting these events. So don't, don't clap for me though, clap, where is Vincent? You're right there, clap for this guy, because he completely busts his ass uh, to make all of this possible, and he does an amazing job. But yeah, so without much further ado, it is September 20th. Let's talk about what's on the docket. First, we've got some wonderful sponsors. We're going to let them say their piece for a minute. Uh, we've got some fun games. We've got some updates about upcoming events. Uh, and then we've got our main talk uh, after some lightning talks that are kind of related to ML as well. So, Brooksource folks, thank you for sponsoring us and, and come on up. Hello, everybody. How are we doing? Happy Tuesday. Hope we enjoyed uh, the tacos today. Hope we got some. I know we were running a little slim there. Maybe you made some fun nachos. Um, but just to introduce myself, I'm Renee Portenlanger, and I work with Brooksource out of Tampa. If you're not familiar with us already, we are an IT um, professional services and staffing organization. We were originally founded with our workforce transformation program, which is designed to upskill professionals, both professionally and technically within the IT space. I'm um, super excited to be here. I want to thank Tampa Devs and Vincent for having us here and being able to network with you today. If you are interested in maybe a career change or maybe, you know, learning adjacent skill sets or any of the programs that we do have, I did leave my cards over there. Um, the first five people, just to get some, you know, career conversations started, the first five people to like Brooksource on LinkedIn and LinkedIn message me their resume will get a Starbucks gift card. So get on that. But happy to be here. Thanks, guys. Yeah, we really appreciate them. Next up, we've got some folks from DevOps Tampa Bay. This is a great event, and they're going to tell you all about it. Hey, everybody. We, we've talked to a few of you guys. Uh, we're part of the organizing committee for DevOps Days Tampa Bay. This event's coming uh, next month, October 21st, and we're going to be down in St. Pete um, at the USF campus. And uh, it's going to be a great event. We've got two tracks, uh, one on security and one on like DevOps and cloud native technologies. Uh, there's going to be open spaces. We're going to have lightning talks. We, we do have like one or two spots for some of those talks. So if somebody's interested, you can come find me and we can chat about it. We've also got a ton of amazing sponsors that are there that, you know, we're going to have a job board and they're all looking for contacts and resources. So if you're looking for something like that, um, James is going to talk about some of the sponsors we've got. Absolutely. And before I do that, if anybody doesn't know about DevOps Days, it's not a normal conference. It's a kind of a homegrown local conference. All the um, pretty much all the speakers are organizers local. are volunteers. So we're just yeah. volunteering our time to host up this conference. Uh, all the money we get from sponsors goes right back into serving the community. Uh, and we seat up the next event based on a, a little bit of that. So uh, and it, the overall pricing is, is relatively, um, it, it's really cheap. Um, the, we have a lot of uh, sponsors like SpectroCloud, 42Crunch, Noble9, Dynatrace, Datadog, uh, Trend Micro, Sysdig, Diamante, uh, Xspirit, Envizero, <laughs> yeah. uh, Zoho, Harrison Clark, and a lot of others, and a lot of other local communities, including Tampa Bay Devs is sponsoring this event as well. And when you signed up or came in, you should have been asked a question if you wanted to um, participate in, in the participate raffle. Thank you. <laughs> He's much faster than I am. I've had a long day. The, um, so what we're going to be contacting out who are the winners of that. And then the other thing we're going to do is for the first, there's a lot of people here. Well, so we'll so do, normally the tickets are $100. Right now we've got an early bird pricing up there on the site for $75. But we wanted to do a special discount to support this community because we believe in having it be local. And so we've got a, a discount code, TPA Devs 10, um, where that takes even more off. So it's even lower than early bird pricing. So 
um, Tampa Bay or DevOps Days Tampa Bay. You can go out there. Um, we've got it out on Eventbrite. Um, we're going to have, you know, you can easily find it, but it, it's good content and it's going to help support the local community as well. Yep. And that, that discount is going to be for like the first 20 people. Um, it's going to be 50% off. So it's going to be basically half price, even cheaper than the early bird by quite a bit. So, so yep. thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, so this will be a great event if you're looking for uh, an opportunity to network with more people and kind of learn more about like DevOps and security, that's definitely a spot to go. Next up, speaking of learning, we've got some folks from DataQuest. This is a really exciting educational platform for ML, and they're going to tell you all about it. Hi, I'm um, Celeste Grutman, and I'm here from DataQuest. Uh, DataQuest is a project-based online learning platform, and we're focused primarily on teaching technical data skills. So um, everything from Python to R to statistics and then into machine learning topics, which prompted me to reach out to, to uh, the team here today because I saw that you all were focused here. So if you're looking to add some of those skills or do a little bit of practice, you really want to work on some projects. DataQuest is a great platform. We're actually giving out scholarships to everybody who is here today. So I think, uh, as, as the gentleman said before me, there was a question there. Um, so if you want a scholarship, we'll, we'll get those emails out and we'll send that information out next week um, so that you can uh, practice those skills online. So yeah, thanks so much. Awesome. Yeah, we, we are very grateful for all the support that we get from our various sponsors. And definitely, like, if your company has any kind of interest in working with us, you know, either to just get your name out there, or, you know, do some recruiting or something, we are always looking for folks to partner with. So thanks again to everybody. Give them a big round of applause. Okay. So we have this big QR code. This is for the Tampa Devs, uh, like, Ted Hacks registration, right? Oh, yeah, this is this. If you didn't fill out the form up front, then definitely fill this out. This will let you enter into the raffle and whatnot for uh, some of the tickets and things that we had discussed earlier. And I'll keep that up for a second. Right on. So it has been a year. It's very exciting. So historically, you know, up to this point, we've, we've kind of described Tampa Devs as being a community of software developers seeking to grow together. And we've had a lot of success uh, with that kind of mantra. So our events have steadily grown in attendance. We've been growing at a rate of about 10% uh, per month, which is fairly impressive, and we're continuing to do that. That's actually why we had to come to Embark, because we were starting to hit some limits in terms of the size of the venues that we could host our events in. But what is it that we're actually trying to accomplish, right? Like, that, that's a descriptive statement it's not necessarily describing what our mission is. So first and foremost, what we're trying to achieve with Tampa Devs, we wanna be the fastest growing and kind of premier software development community in Tampa Bay. And essentially, we wanna accelerate people's access to high quality training materials and career opportunities uh, in the local software industry and do this at completely zero cost to every one of our members. So we, we will never institute any type of like membership fee or anything of that nature. We want it to be totally free and accessible, uh, no matter what your means are or where you come from. And obviously to do that, we host a variety of technical workshops and you know, networking events and things of that nature at uh, you know, reputable companies with great speakers. Um, but we have a much grander vision for what we're trying to achieve, right? So ultimately, we're, we're working towards, you know, in year two, we want to continue hosting bigger, uh, better, and more fun events. Uh, so we're hosting a hackathon next month. Uh, we're going to continue to have you know, things in that vein where it's much more engaging, uh, you know, variety than sitting in a room listening to people lecture for a while. Uh, but we also want to support Tampa Bay as a uh, industry-leading kind of technology hub. Uh, obviously, many of you are probably uh, recent transplants to the area. I know I've met tons of folks that like just moved here from places like Seattle or California. Uh, so there's a lot of growth in the tech sector here, like just folks that are new to the area, but also people like myself. I was born and raised in Tampa. And I've always been really deeply interested and passionate about technology. And so seeing the growth of that industry here is just very exciting. And, and Vincent and I and all the other folks that help organize these events are super passionate about supporting that. Uh, 
outside of that, we're just basically gen like our general goal is to provide support and mentorship to folks like whatever their background may be, whether they're a student in a college or if there's somebody that's trying to make a career transition into the technology space. We want to have something available to basically everyone of all different skill levels. And uh, we hope that we're achieving that and that you're finding these events valuable and informative. So with that, I would like to invite up our wonderful MC, Hari, to do our fun Quixie game. Come on, come on, get up here, man. All right. Yeah. So you're in this tab right here, and then that's the main presentation. Go get it. Thank you, Charlton. I'm so excited to be celebrating our anniversary with you tonight, today, and we'll start with this uh, quiz. There are gifts. So do your best. Give it your best shot. You will see the pin number here, and you will be using it uh, to, to log in into this quiz. And once you're all ready, we're going to begin. Get in there. There you go. Three, eight, one, eight, five, six. Ooh, 25 already, 30. Almost 50. I will give it 30 seconds more, and then after that, I'm going to start. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. I begin in ten seconds. Are you ready, guys? Ready, go. It says it's not. What would be a JavaScript, the result of this, the following statement? One, three, and then does in the deck. Next one. So, fastest one was Mike Beer. Let's go to the next one. In an HTML document, it is best practice to always pre uh, place a script at. Is it in the body section? Is it in the header section? The beginning or the end of that? Time's up. It is placed always at the end of the body tag. This is the best practice so that you already have the structure of your HTML document. And then after that, the logic is important. Congrats or Oscar and
Okay. Next one. What is the expected outcome of the following statement in JavaScript? Symbol square. And then the strong, um, the strong equals symbol square again. The answer is false because symbols are unique identifiers. Okay, Chris got that right first. Inside which HTML element do we put the JavaScript? This one is a very straightforward one. First one, script, logic, JavaScript, JS. And time's up. And it is script. In JavaScript, what would be the result of the following statement? Console log type of x. And there is no parentheses around the x. Is it a string, a number, zero? Throws an error because x is not defined. It's a string. JavaScript, you should have those parentheses there, but JavaScript is forgiving. It's a loosely typed language and it will let it go. Congrats to Tony. And the first winner is Tony, who's Tony? Come collect your prize. We also have Oscar and Chris. Please collect your gift from our friend Jonah. Do I see Oscar and Chris too? Yes. And now back on track, guys. Today we are celebrating our first anniversary. Some of you who were here in previous events, you have heard our story. But today I'm presenting to you some evidence for the first time. August 26th of last year was the first time that this idea was born. It was born after another uh, tech event. It was in our neighboring city, Orlando. And we were on our and we were on our way back when uh, Vincent mentioned casually that my friend Vincent here that that was so wonderful. Why don't we have something like that in Tampa? That we, we were still in the post-COVID area those days era. I mean, and we were we were still 
recovering. We didn't have anything like it in Tampa yet after COVID. And then less than a month later, we had our first event. It was a meet and greet event in September 16. And for those of you who have, uh, who have been with us for some time, you know the drill already. We alternate the events. We have a talk, then we have a meet and greet event, and we have a talk again. And so it goes on and on. We met in channel side. And back then, we didn't have any sponsors. It was just a small team, Vincent, and supported by some friends. And then today, today we grew up to have sponsors, a wonderful audience, um, and then followers. And let me hand the mic to my friend Vincent to introduce to you some news about upcoming events, including a hackathon that we have been working on. So yeah, this is our uh, one year anniversary. Well, actually one year and four days, but you know, it's close enough, right? <laughs> um, so um, kind of one year later, these are kind of our stats looking back as we started earlier. Um, we're actually at 1,007 uh, active meetup members right now, which is pretty crazy. It's like one year later, it's like exactly 1,000. Um, we've had events with over 100 attendees and actually some over 200. Does that sound better or, or is, that, is that worse? I can't, I can't really tell. Okay, and um, you know, we're getting really popular on social media. We've been growing out like crazy, as you can tell. I mean, if you ever attend any of our other previous events, this is like, I don't even know how many people are here, like 150. Um, and we've had up to 20 events since September, 2021. Um, actually, Chris right there, the guy in purple, he was actually our very first meetup member. And I remember like, I was just, we, I looked, it was just like a bunch of our friends that got together, right? And then um, I was just like inflating like RSVP numbers and then Chris showed up. And I'm like, oh my God, like someone I don't know is here. <laughs> and then Chris was like, hey, I want to talk to someone that I can actually talk dev shop with. And I'm like, okay, you could talk to me, you could talk to Jonah. And then like everyone else was just friends and they weren't even tech. And it's like, hey, it's like, who else can I talk with? <laughs> We talked about salsa dancing, yeah. So, so surprisingly, a lot of us are dancers too. Um, and we've helped actually a multiple number of people get hired since we started. Um, actually, Harita, we got Harita a job. We got a couple other friends as well, but he's also looking to looking for a new job, by the way. His company kind of laid him off. So if anyone, if anyone can plug him in, you know, he's great at presenting. He's great at project management. He's learning front-end development. So if you guys need to hire somebody and make that 13, um, yeah, we can do that. Uh, so some upcoming events, we have National Techies Day coming up. Uh, this is actually in collaboration with um, High Tech Connect. Daniela, what's up? Over, where, yeah, so, so we have a couple people collaborating, we're collaborating with. So Daniela from High Tech Connect, we're collaborating with her. We're collaborating with um, the Salesforce Meetup Group um, and a couple other places as well. I can't read that, it's kind of, kind of small. But anyways, um, it's gonna be like all the tech groups in town and it's gonna be on October 3rd. So definitely put that on the calendar. It's on Meetup as well. Um, I wanted to cover the hackathon. I know a lot of you have been asking about a little bit what it's about. So um, actually, uh, so Tad Hacks Hackathon is someone I've actually worked with with the last three years when I first started my career. Um, it was like the hackathon that I kind of went to to kind of learn how to code. And I actually won like $5,000 too, or actually me, Jonah and Haritha, we, we all actually won money through this hackathon, like legit, like almost everyone that attended actually took home like a couple hundred dollars. And so what it is, is um, it's a global hackathon where it's for telecommunications. So think of like SMS notifications, um, WebRTC, um, phone automation, whatever, any app you can think of that uses those tools, which is pretty much any startup period. Um, you can build, you can build out over a weekend and there's up to $20,000 like on the, on the prize pool. Right. And so this is like for global, like, it's not just for Tampa. There's one in Chicago, there's one in Berlin, there's one in Sri Lanka and they're all competing globally, but we're like the biggest chapter. Actually the chapter originally started in Orlando, but then, cause I'm from Orlando, I kind of took it from them. So now it's in Tampa now. So we're, it's actually going to be like Tampa's like first student slash professional hackathon. 
that it's seen a long time. So definitely check it out. And usually it's free to attend, you know, as we do always. Free food, um, you know, catering uh, from like Taco Dirty or from, um, from Panda Express, whatever. And there's going to be a lot of students there too. So if you want to network and meet other professionals as well and mentor, we also have a, uh, a sign up form for, for volunteers. It's actually the same one that you signed up on, on the front. Um, so if any of you are interested in helping either volunteer set up, so we need coding mentors. So a lot of students that or a lot of people that are transitioning into tech usually struggle when they're like building out like a React project or like how, how to debug something in CSS. And like a lot of us here like have already done that like a hundred times or millions of times. But you know, when you're first starting, it's like you don't really know exactly how to do it. And so if, if you have any interest in like helping mentor, um, there's a QR code. It's also on the one we had in sign on. Um, you can scan this as well or take a picture of it. Um, we also need setup volunteers for like handling um, kind of like the setup of the venue. It's actually going to be here. So it's going to be here on October 15th to 16th, like on the weekend. So if you're free that day, there's, it's going to be a great event. We're going to have like literally like this entire room completely booked. And there's going to be like seven whiteboards here and people are all in their own sections in the group, like, like basically building a startup in a weekend. You don't have to be a coder, by the way. You could just be like someone just brings ideas or makes a presentation slide or just learns like from other people. So like when I first started, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just literally like, how do I use Git? I don't even know. <laughs> so um, yeah, you don't have to have any experience. Um, we kind of make it openly open and friendly to anybody to join. That way, like, you know, you can learn from others. You can mentor other people. You can, you know, it's a good time. So I highly recommend it. Um, and that's October 15th, 16th it's on the meetup page. We'll put more updates on it too. And then for another upcoming event, um, we're having a mobile development talk as well as a digital nomad lifestyle talk from one of my friends, Andre. I don't think he's here today, but um, it's gonna be a great talk, November. And then Alicia, where are you? Where, where's Alicia? Alicia is giving a talk on CSS processors. And then it's gonna be her first talk. She's trying to transition, transition into tech. So, you know, you'll see on stage and you should hire her for sure. Um, and we have another another presenter um, doing data ETL, which is like automating like data transfer. It's uh, one of the member companies that embark. So that's for December. So definitely look out for that. And then, um, oh, uh, Charlton, you want to do this? Awesome. So lots of great events coming up. So we're going to, it's a, we're a year in, we're going to change up our format a little bit. We're introducing something called lightning talks uh, to add some variety to just our general uh, meeting programming here. So we've got a couple extra bonus speakers that are going to give very short presentations on, uh, you know, some little side tasks and things uh, so that you can kind of whet your appetite for the main talk. So our first presenter, you want to come up? Awesome. Awesome. Let me get our slide deck up. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Oh, there you go. Hey guys, thank you so much for having me. Winston, congratulations on the anniversary. I'm one of the people that met Winston and the entire team on Kava Culture. Back then, this team was growing, and today, a thousand. Followers, that's amazing. Congratulations. Big shout out to Winston and the entire team. So my name is Tamina Amiri, and today I'm representing my company, ArangoDB. And that's my profile on LinkedIn. So before we I move on, you can follow me on LinkedIn. If you have any questions, you can ask. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so ArangoDB is a native multi-model graph databases, and this is an industry that's growing really fast. For some of you, if you know about Gardner, he said that today um, multi-model graph databases generally use 10% in our innovation by 2025 to 2026. That's going to be about 80%. And also, this industry is growing so fast that it will be a $60 billion industry in um, NoSQL databases. And according to Gardner, 
our company, ArangoDB, will be $5.1 billion by 2025. So because there's a lot of information that I'm not covering today because I have only 10 minutes. And so I <laughs> we cut some slides today as well. And ArangoDB was founded in 2012 um, in Germany. And then we got another HQ here in San Francisco. And we have, it's an open source. And we have more than 14 million uh, downloads at the moment. And also we have a huge community that's been used um, by our developers. I'm not sure why it does not show in here, but um, so what we do around the DB, in, uh, we have in native multi-model graph database where you have your documents, full text search, Arango ML, Kube Arango, Freegal, and all of that in one single platform where you have our own query language, which is for somebody who knows how to use MySQL it will be very easy for you to use ArangoDB. It's almost, it's almost like MongoDB, but graph database on top. So those are some of the um, services it provides. So document, key value, graph, and also Arango search, Pregal, Arango ML, and also Kiva Arango. And also we have managed service. So what do we do for the people that are using ArangoDB? Of course, we improve operations and reduce risk and also increase revenue. And I had multiple use cases, but one of the use cases that we have created, it's customer 360. So majority of companies, um, including Amazon, uh, LinkedIn, and so many other big organizations today, they're using recommendation engine customer 360 because they are looking to understand their customer data. Um, for uh, Banks are using for, uh, for example, for fraud detection case, identity access management. Um, this was one of the largest bank in America that used ArangoDB for customer 360. In here, what we did was we looked at their use case where we find out who is the customer or how many customers the bank has. So the, um, that has a lot of money in the bank. And then you can find this customer or list of customers and provide them the premium services by using graph databases and 360. And this resulted as uh, the company, the bank made a lot of profit because now you're getting your customers high premium services. And the last page is our summit that's happening October 5th, 4 and 5th. And I would like for you guys to join. The link is on the meetup. And here we're going to talk about um, uh, big data. We are talking about um, fraud detection use cases. And majority of our customers are going to be they're speaking about their use cases and how they're talking about uh, how they're using machine learning graph databases in general and NoSQL in their use cases. And for more information, that's me. And thank you so much. Thanks for having me today. It's a pleasure meeting everybody. And happy Taco Tuesday. Thank you so much. So next up, we've got uh, Mike Tutora. He's going to talk about his forays into the Mailgun API. Where are you, Mike? There he is, right on time. Okay. Huh? Ten minutes. So I did this talk about an hour ago. Um, I'm wearing the shirt, ironically. People keep saying, oh, yeah, that's great. And there's like one of the few places where I could probably get away with it and people know what it is. But um, I posted some PHP code on the Slack maybe Friday, Thursday, and asked for a code review. And, and <laughs> Charlton gave me this incredible security review, like, bam, and I've applied it already. Uh, this guy. It's like, hey, how'd you like to talk at our meeting on Tuesday? Well, yeah, never say no, right? So um, I was trying to figure out what to ask for. I'd really love to just ask for help with Docker, but I guess I could do that somewhere else. Um, <laughs> because, so that I have to tell a little bit of the story, what I'm trying to do here. 
a friend of mine, kind of struggling freelance web developer, told me that he didn't want to take his um, Bangladeshi web developer off of this project that he hasn't working on, but he had this thing he was trying to do for somebody else. And so I go, well, I'll give it a shot, why not? And it's in PHP. Now, all I know about PHP up till a few weeks ago is that it's one of the three Ps that's the duct tape that holds the internet together. Have any of you guys ever heard that? Um, PHP, Perl, and Python. Now, somebody gave me a Perl book in the 90s and I looked through a little bit and immediately used it to keep a table from wobbling. Um, PHP, all I ever hear about is bad things for some reason, and then occasionally people say good things. And my friend was like, yeah, but it's free. It's on every server. You don't have to install it. And 8.1 is not so bad. Like they're talking about old PHP. So, so I'm like, fine, I'll take a look. And so now what he needed is really a kludge because there are these developers in the Philippines, not his and other guys, that wrote this pretty good website, a little chain of websites. The guy is a business consultant, analyst guy, and he has people take a quiz and on this one website, and that spits out um, a PDF file, and then it emails it to him using mail, Mailgun. But then he wanted to, to automatically subscribe them to ConvertKit. So first I wanna ask people, how many of you use Mailgun? How many of you ever heard of Mailgun? That's what I thought. How about ConvertKit? Same question. I'm gonna ask a bunch of like anybody ever heard of these things. So these are like e-commerce um, solutions. Um, Mailgun is like Mailchimp. Um, ConvertKit is something that um, is used to create campaigns. Um, think like a CRM. And um, the problem is the, 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 the Philippine developers did a great job, but he can't ever get them to respond to him. They're like, he's, they got a turnaround time like two weeks. And so he just wanted to be able to get people that take this test end up in Mailgun because Mailgun sends them the results. So they're recorded as an event in Mailgun. And he wanted to automatically subscribe them to what's called a form and convert kit. And he made, and so my friend is just like, you know, looking for someone to do it. I'm like, well, I'll give it a shot. I've never even looked at PHP before, but let me see if I can do it. So that was two, three weeks ago. Um, and I'm afraid to, I'm going to, I'm going to run through, like I have seven slides. I'm going to run through them all. If there's any time, then maybe we could go a little deeper. I'm not going to really get into any code right now. I don't think anybody here wants that. Um, so that's the why PHP. So how about Docker? So I've never even run PHP before. I never looked at PHP before. I sort of knew what it was. I'm a, I'm a statistical ecologist wannabe data scientist that started out with Fortran and basic and then got the SAS and R and then finally Python. So, so it was more for me like a personal challenge just to see if I could learn a language fast enough to do something useful. And I think I did. So the whole bit about why Docker so I look at, gee, I really don't want to install PHP on my machine. I don't want to pollute it with that stuff. So um, <laughs> as I'm looking around, um, I found this, this blog post, and, and I could share this talk. So this guy says the, the um, best practice for running PHP is in Docker. So you don't even install PHP locally. You just run it in Docker. Now I'm a Docker noob also. So this is great because that means I get to struggle with two different technologies at once. And here we go. I find um, his solution is really convenient because it also gives you Ajax and um, uh, one or the other uh, databases. And I finally realized I don't even want either of those. So I finally find um, another way to, I learn a little bit about Docker and how many people know what Docker is? Okay, now we're getting somewhere. So I installed Docker. I run through Docker tutorials. Um, I eventually get to just a, a command. Um, I'm doing it in, in Windows, just the command line. I, I, I could go on about that, but I don't have time for that. So really just one line 
uh, after after initializing Docker, I fire up this one line. It pulls down the PHP 8.1 and throws this code at it that I wrote. And the first time you run it, it downloads the package and you're done. And then it'll automatically see if there's any revisions. So it takes care of revision history for you and all that stuff. You don't have to worry about it. So I, I struggled with the Mailgun API for a while. And I also know about this thing called Postman. How many of you have heard of Postman? All right. So I, I Google Postman Mailgun and find they have an integration for it. So I've never really used Postman before, but that's another thing I always thought I should learn how to do it. It basically, for those of you that don't know, it makes running APIs easy. It makes doing the experimentation to get the thing to work. Like there's a GUI and you, you enter what you think is gonna work and right away it either does or it doesn't, you keep away at it. So that turns out, well, the Mailgun, there's like a, I forget what they call them in Postman, but it's like an environment that's already written that has a lot of the Mailgun stuff, like the Mailgun API already integrated. But that was version one, so then I had to figure out how to, how to convert it to version two in Postman, got that working, figured out how to get the API to run, and then in Postman you say, okay, just give me the code in whatever language you want. And that's the other thing that makes it easy, it writes the code for you. So this is like a low code solution. How many of you have heard of low code solutions? Okay, so I get curl down. If you know, probably don't know curl, it's looking like, but the way that a high level programming language talks to machines on the internet is called an API for application programmer interface. Um, it gives me the commands already written in the language of my choice, not Python, but PHP. And so then I put that into a PHP file and start trying to figure out how to make that work with ConvertKit which, and there's a link that if I had time I'd go to that is the ConvertKit's documentation on their API, which is how to subscribe email addresses to a form. I got a minute, 51 seconds left. So basically it's like PHP without Docker, without with PHP without PHP, because I never installed PHP really on my machine. It's there in the local on the, in the Windows drive, but I'm running it in Docker and there along the bottom here, is, is the command that I kind of know what all these things do, and I'm not gonna explain them. I could explain them, but I'm not gonna. That shows that I'm using PHP 8.1 for those in the know, the command line interface, and the program it's gonna run is called curl convert PHP. And my name's Michael Tortora. I'm also looking for work. There's my GitHub that has the code. I called it gun kit not because I really like guns, but because it's mail gun and convert kit. And um, you can find me most places as long as you know that the second letter of my last name is a U. Otherwise you might get in trouble. Uh, 52 seconds, any questions? I got a whole minute. Okay, thanks. awesome all righty so let's get back to the main presentation so kicking it right along so we have a call for speakers if you want to get up here and talk about something cool then uh, we are definitely interested so you can email us at speakers at tampadevs.com and just kind of briefly describe whatever it is that you want to talk about and we'd love to you know give you a slot to to talk about that all right, we also have some swag. We've just got like 2,000 stickers. So if you want some free Tampa Dev stickers, do let us know. Plus we have some hats and some shirts. Uh, and then this is all of our different social media information if you'd like to connect with us. Okay, Vincent, you wanna introduce our main talk? Yeah, so this talk will be with Moon Tosser right here. Uh, me and Muntasa actually go a really long way back. We've competed in so many hackathons. Yeah, come up here, man. We competed in so many hackathons together. Um, the first one over there was when we went to, well, it, was, it was actually Tad Hacks, right? Tad Hacks, yeah. yeah, we went to Tad Hacks, the one we were just advertising. I think that's where we met, right? Yes. That was where we met. And we, well, I didn't compete with you, though. I competed with someone else. But you, you competed against me. I competed against them. And then I think, I think you beat us, actually. I <laughs> I think we were second place. I think we were second place. But then the next day after Tad Hacks, we went to a 
a uh, center here. We went we to went we went to, to uh, we went to uh, we went to a conference. Conference. That, yes, that yes. actually, yeah, they're actually giving a uh, conference tickets as for Enterprise Connect. As Enterprise well. Connect. Yeah. I so, was on Enterprise so Connect we went to a conference right after as part of Tad Hacks, and we just like got a bunch of free swag. And we literally just made rounds like collecting Amazon gift cards and like free Zoom shirts and T-shirts. I think we got like, I don't know. Like I, got a, an, I, I got an Amazon show and then <laughs> they had like all sorts of crazy stuff. Like they had this little blower thing where they uh -huh. blow dollar bills and there are people in suits like inside trying to grab yeah. every single dollar bill. Oh, yeah, there. I remember that. So, yeah. And then we get on to another hackathon over in like, where is this? This was in St. Louis. We this was in St. Louis. It was in Missouri. No, it was in Missouri, um, Cape Girardeau. Yeah, we literally drove like 20 hours like from Florida over there. And then we built this, we built this like contraption right here. You can't really see it, but it's literally like, imagine like an automatic food dispenser. But like instead of for food, it's for like medical pills for elderly patients. And we literally just built it out of garbage and Arduino yeah. and we, other. <laughs> we built a pill dispenser out of cardboard and it, and it actually worked. So. Yeah, so so Matasa is kind of give, give me like an overview on like machine learning. We've, he's, he's always been like the data science guy on our teams and um, have a long history together. So I just wanted to introduce Matasa first Thank before you. we do that. <laughs> but yeah, here, uh, I'm going to hand it off to you now. All right. Uh, how do I go to my? Oh, okay. So you <laughs> escape. And then your talk is right there. There you go. All right. All right. Give up for my saucer. All right, so um, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Muntasar Syed, and uh, I am going to be talking about uh, machine learning. So um, I come from a hybrid background, so I do have industry experience as well as academic experience. So I'm going to make this talk a little bit of um, reflective of my hybrid uh, background as well. So just before we get started, how many of you guys have, well, I'm assuming everybody's heard of machine learning, which is why you're here, or um, if you're in tech, you've probably heard of machine learning. Um, how many of you guys have actually taken a some sort of class or course or coursework in machine learning. Okay, that's that's fair enough. So that's about half of you. Um, for the other half, this will be um, something that gives you an insight into what this box or this um, magic thing called machine learning actually is. Um, hint, hint, it's uh, a bunch of the math that you were told you'll never see again in your life. Well, that was, that was kind of a lie. It, it's come back, um, like a lot of things. OK, um, for the rest of you who've, see, who've had a class, this might be a little bit of a rehash, but it does lead into some exciting stuff. I promise you there will be some demos where you can get to play around with things like Dolly and um, uh, text generation and all that good stuff. All right, so let's get started. Uh, if we can. Get this thing to work. Oh. oh. Yeah. Okay. So um, some dry stuff out of the way. Um, machine learning, as the word implies, it's basically a bunch of computer algorithms. And um, the key word in machine learning is machine, which means there's a high level of uh, automation um, inside this uh, this approach. And it's generally considered a branch of artificial intelligence, um, which is, again, a branch of computer science. And um, what you do is essentially you feed a machine some data, and it intelligently somehow comes up with rules that allow you to do things which would be tedious for people to do. Um, there's, a, there's a very common joke in the ML industry. Um, if you use Python, you are doing machine learning. If you use PowerPoint, you're doing AI. So um, that a lot of people see it that way. Um, I don't because um, I kind of know of some AI which is not machine learning. But uh, if you guys are interested in, in a more rigorous definition of machine learning, the place to start is actually statistics. OK, 
So um, when we do machine learning or when we teach a machine to learn or to be intelligent, there is a pipeline we have to follow. And the key um, thing we wanna get out of a machine or a learned machine or an intelligent machine is a decision. So we want the machine to decide something for us instead of us doing the decision. And the reason why this is learning or intelligent is that this decision is not necessarily mm. deterministic, which means um, a lot of or a lot of AI algorithms usually boil down to a bunch of if then statements. If this condition, if that condition, if that condition, then X result. Yeah. Okay. So um, a lot of a lot of machine learning um, hinges on the fact that these decisions are not deterministic, which means you cannot guarantee a hundred percent of the time. Um, if you have these conditions, you will get X result. You might not. And um, if you do, as we're gonna see, then your model probably has a problem. Machine learning is data driven. So um, this is the old computer adage, garbage in, garbage out. Um, you put good data in, you'll get a good model. You put bad data in, you'll get a bad model. And um, there are things which you can do to make the efficiency of your learning better with data but there's no real way around not having good data and having a good model. Um, the way we evaluate or score how well a machine learning model does is very analogous to human learning. So if you go to a class and you learn, at the end you do an exam or you do a test and then you're scored. And that's pretty much the same, same approach we have with machine learning models. Machine learning models are, um, the big thing in machine learning models now is optimization. Um, because in general, you can train a model to do certain tasks, and then you can further train or optimize them to do a special subset of some particular task that you want, um, that you want to achieve. And then of course, um, the iteration and reiteration. So um, a lot of machine learning happens because of our, or is happening because of our ability um, with our modern day hardware to reiterate the learning process over and over and over and over again. So when somebody says, oh, my model is training or this model takes X number of hours to train, it basically means it's going through the same data over and over and over again, and it's following a certain process. We're gonna, go, we're gonna take a quick look behind the scenes of how this works. And then we are, um, we're gonna go forward. So let's. Okay, um, I don't need to explain this to a bunch of people who are in the tech industry. Why machine learning? Well, um, the machine learning is a very lucrative field. Um, personally, I'm not into machine learning for the money. Um, otherwise I would not have the academic part of my existence, but um, it is thankfully for me and for my friends and colleagues who are in machine learning, it is a very lucrative field and um, it is ubiquitous, which means there are very few technical fields which are not touched by uh, advances in machine learning. Um, machine learning is new and it's fast moving. So it's a, um, there's a direct correlation between what you put into it, how much you learn and the reward you get out of it. So if you are up to date with the newest techniques, newest approaches, um, you will find a place in the, in the job market. Well, for now. Okay. Um, the pervasiveness of machine learning is something that's very, um, very well known. We have now machine learning algorithms and models that work on pretty much every field. Everywhere you can use data to make a decision is a place where you can fit machine learning into. And Here's the, um, here's the big gap that people as technologists can get into. Because this field is new, there are always opportunities for new avenues to be explored, which are pervasive across multiple domains and multiple fields. And this means that like you have database administrators that can work across various fields, 
you can have machine learning engineers and machine learning um, experts and advocates that can work across um, various domains as well. Okay, um, back to our basic principles. Um, the algorithm that a machine learning model employs basically makes a prediction or a classification based on some data. And ultimately, whether your algorithm or model is good or not depends on the decision or um, the output that it gives you. It's not necessarily that the model gives you a 100% accurate decision. It gives you an optimal decision. So the difference between a maximal and an optimal is the optimal um, using the law of averages is better always in the long run. Okay. So um, when we talk about uh, the data used in machine learning, um, we use data at pretty much every single step of the machine learning pipeline. Um, machine learning usually involves taking a model which has been pre, um, which is a well-known model that you can tweak. You put some data into the model to train it. You put some data into the model, some other data into the model to evaluate how your training went. And then finally, you put some more data into the model to test how well your algorithm did. So there is data being used at every single step of developing a machine learning model. Um, so machine learning as a career choice is always very closely tied to data science and data engineering. So if you are a machine learning engineer, by default, you will have a good background in data wrangling and data handling processes. Okay, so um, when we talk about evaluation or um, errors that we get from a machine learning model, so the error essentially tells us how well our model did. So when we train our model, we have to evaluate the model on a ongoing basis. And we have to ask the correct questions based on what our model is doing. So of course, the first question is, was it wrong? Was it wrong or was it right? There's no two ways about it. And then there's another metric that kind of tells us, OK, how wrong? So if I ask my model, what is 1 plus 1, and it tells me it tells me 2.2, that's wrong. But it's not as wrong as it telling me it's 10, right? So this is, uh, this is something that a machine learning engineer knows how to evaluate and score their models and determine things called hyperparameters, which determine how well the machine is learning. And obviously, the one question that should always have an answer called yes is, can it be improved? So an ideal model can always be improved. However, is it satisfactory to use it as is? If the answer is yes, you can improve it later. You can deploy the model you have and then improve it iteratively over time. OK. Um, when we optimize, if we can get our model to fit all the data points in the, um, in the training set, then we can calculate what the training error is. Of course, we want to see how to reduce the training error. And this is usually done by um, three basic concepts. One is by updating the parameters that we have fed into our model search for a new set of parameters, or use some mathematical or statistical approaches, um, which we will touch on briefly. So here's the most fundamental part of um, machine learning, which is we're basically looking to collapse our problem into something that represents this graph. And if we can collapse our problem into a graph like this, our problem question becomes, can I find the lowest point in this graph? And this is a very simple graph. It's in two dimensions. Here's a graph in three dimensions, but we're doing the same thing. We're finding this, the lowest point, the bottom point, okay? Um, 
human beings can't really imagine more than three dimensions because our world is a three dimension, like our space, we only see three spatial dimensions. But if you think about it, a machine learning model can have multiple parameters, each parameter represented by a dimension. The problem essentially stays still the same. Can I formulate my question so that at the end of the day, all my algorithm is doing is looking for that lowest point. And this is probably the most intuitive, non-mathematical way of describing what a machine learning algorithm actually is doing, right? So if you think about it, um, in two dimensions, it's pretty easy. You start off with any random point and you look to your left and look to your right. If the point to your left is lower, keep following that point until you get to a point where neither the left or right is lower, which means I've reached my lowest point. In the three-dimensional space, um, it's a little bit harder because there might be something you don't see. So you might have to employ a more clever searching technique, but it's essentially the same principle. You're looking for a place where you are optimally at a point where nothing near you is higher. You might get stuck in a place where it's not actually the lowest point, but there are ways to go around this, which means you need to search parallelly in different directions. This approach is called gradient descent. And this is the driving force behind pretty much all the modern machine learning approaches you see, all the, all the fancy words and everything. Mathematically, this is one of the basic tools which is, which is being used. And um, if you remember the calculus that would never come back in your life, the way to find this one is by getting a derivative, well, second derivative. Okay, um, so when we do machine learning, machine learning is almost never a one-shot process, although there are algorithms which can learn a lot of things in one go, but the best algorithms usually have a multiple, um, multiple iterations or multiple epoch training cycles. And the questions we need to answer when we are training a model are, how do we optimize those initial parameters? When we have some data, we want to split that data between training data and testing data. Now, this split is not always straightforward. A lot of times people say, oh, just split it 70% training, 30% testing. Well, the idea here is your testing data should be representative of the real world. You're cutting your data into chunks. So your chunks should have a good and good amount of coverage and the distribution should be very, um, it should be representative of what, of the problem you're trying to, trying to solve. Um, we can apply uh, various data engineering techniques. Um, this is something that is, if you deal with data, you need to clean data, you need to filter data, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can try ensemble approaches. Ensemble approaches means you don't need to only try one algorithm. You can try a bunch of algorithms and then have them actually race against each other and see which one works better. Um, a question you need to answer is, when do you actually stop training? Well, the naive answer is, you stop training when the model doesn't do any better. But, well, the model might not do better for a little while, but then it might jump or it might actually get worse. So this is a question that you should always consider. Um, do you ever stop training? Well, for practical terms, yes, you have to stop training, but um, do you continue training after you've deployed a model? And oftentimes the answer is no. Um, you can continue training with the new data that you acquire from the field. Um, overfitting versus underfitting. So overfitting means when your data 100% analyzes or scores your training data with 100%. This basically means that your your model believes that the training data is everything that it will see in the real world, which is often not true. If it is true, then you're good. You have a perfect model. But the problem with our data for machine learning is that the data is never 100% representative of what you're going to see in the real world, which means your model should not be 100% sticky with the data. So you should have, if you get 100% um, accuracy all the time, your model is overfitting. 
Very good question. So to choose the parameters to train your model is very domain specific. So when I say domain specific, it means if I have a domain, let's say I have the field of politics, right? And I'm collecting data about opinions of certain people. Now, if there is a parameter I'm missing, say for example, the geographic location of people, then I will find that my data distribution does not follow normal mathematical distributions, which means um, if I try to graph my data, it's not going to look normal. It's not going to give me a bell curve. Therefore, that means that I have to search for further parameters that might describe my data better, or that might have my, uh, or that might provide a better input to my machine learning model. We're going to take a look at um, uh, something that answers that question um, in uh, in detail. So, like we said, uh, data is the core of machine learning. Um, in this slide, I just want to focus on two things. First is data versus information. So information is what you can gather out of data. So it's the meaningful thing that the data represents. A data is just numbers. It's a point in, in some dimensional space. But information is what's, what's meaningful about this or what relation does this piece of data have with something else or something useful that I can get out of it. And the other thing is the data pipeline. So a, pi a well-constructed data pipeline will consider things like cleaning, um, um, gathering useful information and um, scaling among other things. So here's, uh, I'm not sure if you guys can see this, but this is a typical data pipeline where you put in some data and then it goes through various stages. Um, it goes through extraction, validation, cleaning, training, evaluation, and then um, model validation. And finally, um, when you have a model, you store in a bunch of features and then you retrain the model using the same pipeline. Okay. Um, again, to answer that question, this is something that will that'll kind of shed some light on it. Um, we need to, when we feed data to a machine learning algorithm, we have to consider the amount of entropy in the data. So um, in, our, in physics, entropy means it's a, it, it's a measure of chaos. Um, in information science and in uh, computer science, entropy has a similar meaning, but not exactly the same. It essentially means the amount of information. So this, picture on the left side, this is a low entropy situation. This picture on the high, on the right side is something with high entropy. Like in physics, this is low entropy um, because there is more order, less chaos. And this is high entropy because there is more disorder. Um, in a low entropy situation, the amount of information we need to correctly classify something is low, which is why we have, which is why it's called low entropy. And here, in order to classify something, you need a lot of information, not just um, something which is obvious or apparent. Okay, um, we're gonna get into the types of machine learning. We're gonna talk a little bit about the different types of machine learning, and then we're gonna go into our demos, which is something that I hope you guys will enjoy. So there are essentially three different types of machine learning. Four, if you consider reinforcement, but we're gonna go through all of them. So the type of machine learning, the first type or the classical machine learning is called the supervised machine learning model. So supervised machine learning means the model knows a priori what the truth is. So we train it on data, which is correctly labeled. So we have data that accurately represents things. We train the model on it, and then we deploy the model to look at other things in the world where we can, um, where we can get some data that we haven't seen before. Unsupervised models effectively are kind of 
discovery type models, which means we are given some data, but they're not, they're either unlabeled or they're not completely labeled, which means it's up to the model to figure out what this data represents. So you're using your machine learning model to find out about the data that's fed. Um, Semi-supervised lies somewhere between supervised and unsupervised. And that means that the data that's fed to the model is partially labeled. So there are labels, but the labels might not be complete. The labels might not be 100% accurate, or um, there might be a mixture of some labeled and some unlabeled data. And lastly, there's a different type of learning called reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is a little bit different. It's come up in the news a bit recently um, because of some of the advances in reinforcement learning. So I'll give you an example. Reinforcement learning is when you have a machine learning model that doesn't know about, let's say, a certain game. Let's say it doesn't know about StarCraft or it doesn't know chess or it doesn't know Go. And what it does is it keeps observing people play games. And then it learns the rules of the game by not being, not by being fed information, but by observation. It makes observations about the environment around it, and then it develops its own system of play. It develops its own internal rules. And what's been shown is that when we have very powerful reinforcement learning models, they actually outperform human beings at classical games like chess, Go, um, computer games like StarCraft, and um, you name it, any system that has uh, an interface where we can deploy a reinforcement learning model, usually um, they end up beating the, um, the best human players in that, uh, in that scenario. Okay, um, so supervised machine learning models have pretty much a very well-known pipeline. We can train, evaluate, and test the data. We have something called dimensionality that we need to always um, consider when we are doing supervised machine learning problem. Dimensionality, again, um, goes back to that picture we saw before where we're finding the, the lowest point. So as you can see, with two dimensions, it's easy. Three dimensions, it's also doable. But if you have 12, 15, 20, 50 dimensions, we fall into something called the curse of dimensionality, which means the algorithm, um, in order to find the optimal point, the higher the number of dimensions, the harder it is for the algorithm to succeed and the less likely it is to succeed given certain time. Um, there is uh, something in the data we have to consider, which is bias and variance. So your data might have a high variance, but it might not be biased or the other way around. Your data might have a high bias and a low variance, but you need to recognize this. Some classic uh, algorithms, I'm not going to go into the details, are k-nearest neighbors, support vector machines, and different types of uh, regression as well as tree-based algorithms. So these are the classical machine learning algorithms before neural networks made um, or became ubiquitous. And um, here's how these things work. KNN pretty much says, if I have a point, I just need to identify where this point goes, which class does it belong to. Linear regression, um, in very simple terms, how far is a given point away from an optimal line? So you draw a line and you figure out what the distance is between um, each point in the line. And this line is optimal so that um, it has the minimum distance, um, minimum error margin between all the different points which are given in my data set. Uh, logistic regression is the same thing as linear regression, except it's not a line. It's a boundary that can have an arbitrary shape. Um, support vector machines are um, also a regression type concept, but they are more represented by vectors instead of lines. And instead of having a line separating classes, there is a hyperplane in multi dimensions. In unsupervised machine learning, in supervised machine learning, if you remember, we, we give you a point or the algorithm sees a point and then it has to decide where does it belong. In unsupervised machine learning, we need to figure out what the ideal groupings are or how many things there are or how many groups there are. 
um, a very good example or a very um, poignant example of unsupervised machine learning is anomaly detection. So when you have things, uh, algorithms, which are, these are very, very commonly used algorithms um, in network security, election analysis, fraud analysis. Um, in Las Vegas, when people look at winnings and people look at play patterns, anomaly detection is one of the first ways they figure out there might be something wrong, somebody might be cheating, et cetera. And um, in anomaly detection, what happens is you're given data which is not labeled and the algorithm forms clusters and we immediately identify points which lie outside the optimal clusters that have been, um, that have been generated. Um, there is, uh, again, math heavy thing called uh, principal component analysis. And the point, I'm not gonna go into the math, but the idea behind principal component analysis is remember that number of dimensions we had, the problem of too many dimensions. So one way of reducing dimensions is called principal components analysis. And this essentially does some clever math to only pick the most important dimensions that describe our data well. Okay, now we're gonna get into our exciting stuff, which is neural networks. Yes. Sorry? Okay, PC, oh, the implementation. So PCA implementations are available in scikit-learn. They're available in um, a, a lot of R packages, a lot of MATLAB packages. And uh, this is very ubiquitous with any kind of machine learning framework that you have. Um, usually if they're based on uh, sklearn, they will have a, um, they will have a PCA implementation. Okay. All right, getting into uh, neural networks. So the idea of neural networks is pretty much emulate how the brain works or how organic brains work. Organic brains are made of things called neurons, which look like this. And we, we all have like trillions of these, I hope. Um, and uh, the way they work is there is an ionic potential difference at these ends called dendrites. And they send an electric signal that goes back and forth through the, um, through the cytoplasm, which is, um, which is then connected to some other parts, either other neurons or to things like muscles. So that's pretty much where the comparison ends because artificial neural networks effectively are a mathematical representation of conveying a signal from one point to another while adding some sort of function underneath. So here, um, the general function that's used is a sigma function, which is addition. So it basically adds together everything, evaluates what the, uh, what the addition gives us, and depending on this evaluation, progresses a signal to the next layer. And there are, you can have a network with multiple layers, so there's an input layer which actually gets the data and an output layer which gives you a signal that corresponds to what the neural network believes is true. Um, there are different types of uh, neural networks. Um, the most commonly used one is the CNN or the convolutional neural network. There are also RNNs, recurrent, um, long short term memory, uh, generative ad uh, adversarial networks. And all these networks are different types of architectures based on how the, how the neurons in these layers are connected. Sometimes there are loopbacks. So a network uh, connection might go from one back to the previous one or back a few. The way these work is called back propagation. So once you pass through all the layers with a bunch of data, you calculate the error and then you propagate the error back and you recalculate what's going to happen. Okay. Um, neural networks are not new. Um, they were thought of in the 50s, but we only have been using them practically since the last about 10 years or so, or 10 or 12 years, because of the advent of high performance computing and GPUs. Um, before that, they were a theoretical toy where 
we could I, ideally do some stuff, but we never had the practical resources to pull off a large scale neural network. Now we do, and now we are actually seeing the fruits of research that has been decades in the making. Um, and finally, Reinforcement learning, um, like I said, the AI in games, environments, objectives, um, agents which operate in uh, environment, either simulated or real, um, are agents that employ reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning um, has something called an objective function, which means this is the target or this is the win condition. And the way reinforcement learning works is the model tries to optimize for an objective function all the time. The discovery with reinforcement learning is the fact that reinforcement learning is um, multi-purpose and multidisciplinary. So an implication of that is if I, tra if I train um, an AI machine learning model to be really good at StarCraft, I can actually take that model and apply it to a different game. And within a few iterations, it's going to start getting better at that game also, which means you can actually take basic principles, which it learns from a certain domain and apply it to various other domains. And this is the secret sauce or the magic of reinforcement learning. And this is um, pretty much how it works. So you have an agent playing a game, which is the environment. And then it gets a reward or a penalty based on what action it does. And it keeps doing it again and again. So it plays, let's say, a million games of Pac-Man until it discovers the ideal route for Pac-Man to take. OK. Um, so when we are training machine learning models, we need to answer the questions that we, um, that we asked previously, which is, how good was the model? And yes. Very good. So one classic solution to getting out of the local optimum dilemma is to not train only on one scenario, to parallelly train various different scenarios with randomized start locations. So when you go to a location, let's say um, we're starting the Pac-Man at this location, we have another game in parallel where the Pac-Man starts at that location. And we actually run a lot of these scenarios in parallel and then look at which one does the best across all these scenarios. And this is kind of an ensemble way of um, avoiding the local minimum problem. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. So when we want to evaluate any machine learning algorithm or pretty much anything to do with data, uh, this is a very important. How many of you guys have seen this, seen this thing? OK, some of you. So this is a um, metric which is used a lot in data science, which is um, whether, we are, whether our results represent true negatives, um, false positives, false negatives, or true positives. Now, um, on the face of it, it might look like, OK, all we want are true positives. Yes, that's ideal. We want, like, everyone wants a true positive result. But that's not, a, that's not practical. In the real world, you will get errors. You will get, um, you will get uh, issues. So then the question is, are all the other ones treated the same? So is the false positive, is it OK if I have some true positives and some false positives? Or are the false positives really bad? And I can deal with true positives and false negatives or true positives and true negatives um, more than I can deal with true positives and false positives. Which means it's OK for me to have a bunch of true positives and some false positives than true positives and true negatives. Or true positives and false negatives, sorry. So um, I'll give you an example of that. Right? So if you are taking a uh, COVID-19 test, um, would you be OK with getting a false, more false positives than more false negatives? If you're taking a diabetes test, any kind of medical test, diabetes test, pregnancy test, whatever, you name it. 
So um, the value of the false positive and false negative are not always the same. So what our objective is, is our model should optimize for what we want the real life value to represent, right? So if I can deal with some false positives, which means, hey, if I got a false positive, I'll just test again, right? So um, I might prefer that than having a false negative. No, what I said is false positive. Yes, false positive. Yeah. So. Why, why would you do test again? You would say false. Positive. No. So if I have a false positive, so if I know my model sometimes gives me false positives, I can test again because then probabilistically it's going to reduce by an exponential fact. Like, uh, if it's a negative, it's going to be. It's very hard for me to get two positives in a row, which is why you will see a lot, of, um, a lot of tests. A lot of times when you test for something um, and it turns out positive, they tell you to test again. Um, because a lot of data science and a lot of machine learning models for that matter are developed with having a tolerance for more false positive than having a tolerance for more false negatives. Okay, okay so that concludes the theory part of my talk. Um, my name is Montasar Sayed. I'm a PhD candidate, um, along with my uh, friends, my partner, Eptisam. We've won more than 100 awards at more than 200 hackathons. And um, I'm going to also probably be, so if there's a hackathon coming up, I'll probably be involved. A lot of resources for machine learning exists online, Coursera. Um, PRML is a book that I highly recommend if you want to get into the mathematics. PRML stands for Pattern Recognition Machine Learning. And um, there's a bunch of courses on Udacity you can also look up. Okay, so now for the demos. So the first demo I wanted to do with you guys, um, if you don't have your laptop, this might not be very uh, doable, but if you scan this QR code, um, you will go to something called Teachable Machine. Okay, I'll give you guys, so, um, I want you guys to try, like if you can't do it on your phone, I want you guys to try this at home. This is actually a very good way to see how basic machine learning classification algorithms work. And um, it's basically teachable machine with google.com. So you can get started. And teachable machine has three types of projects you can do. You can do an image project and we can do a sample image project where we can record stuff with our hands. So that's hand, and then I can record. So that's thumb. So here I can call this guy hand and that guy thumb. and we can train your model. And here, this is a very simple example. You can use your own data, you can use your own images. And once, um, once this, is, uh, this is trained, we can actually generate code from this site that you can embed into your own website. Um, so here, so let's see. So if I do that, that's a hand. If I do that, that's a thumb. Okay, so this is very, it's very straightforward. Um, if you click on export model, you will get some TensorFlow.js code. And for how many of you guys know JavaScript here? A bunch of you guys, because I saw the quiz results. I did really bad. I'm JavaScript dyslexic. So. Um, you can get some JavaScript code that you can embed and it will give you the same kind of classification that was deployed over here. And um, if you want a lighter model that loads faster on your website, you can actually go and uh, get the TensorFlow Lite model. If you develop Android apps or iOS apps, you can deploy this app on there. Um,
we can do an audio project. So the audio project, I'm not gonna go do the project, but you can record or upload some sounds and um, you can get to classify things like bird noises, like different sounds. So for example, um, you wanted to make, uh, um, make a model that detects if your window is broken. So you can actually pick up a bunch of shattering noises and um, you can train those and deploy it and deploy it to your app or device. Um, Pulse project, this is, uh, this is actually, uh, all right, let me just show you how to do a Pulse project. So let's do Pulse project. So it basically um, detects the pose of a person. And if I wanted to do this, so here is my other post. So, okay. So let's do, this is face and this is body. Okay. And you can actually use people's, um, you can use people's poses to calculate what they're doing. So things like holding up your hand in a certain shape, American Sign Language, et cetera. And um, uh, even not just people, you can do um, animal poses. Um, you, can, you can calculate things like exercise poses. So if you are building like a, like a, workout, like a workout helper, you can actually have your camera detect whether you're doing a rep correctly or not. So push-ups, pull-ups, et cetera. And once that's done, um, again, the process is the same. You train the model, you can export it. And uh, the best part of this is um, I didn't need to sign in or log in or anything. It's free. So here, for example, if I do that. Wait. Yeah. So now, as you can see, my whole body, it says that's my body. But if I come close. Closer. That's my. That's just my face. Okay. So I'm not gonna do any exercise reps here, but um, you get the you get the point. So I actually have a model that <laughs> that that's trained on push-ups. Okay. Um, if you talk to me afterwards, I'll show you. Okay. Again, same thing. You can get TensorFlow code. You can get JavaScript code that you can embed, and this will be usable in your applications. Okay, so that's the Teachable Machine um, demo. And uh, I would like, um, if, you get, if you guys go home, um, please try it out. Again, that's the QR code. Okay. The next thing I wanna demo for you guys is Dali Min. How many of you guys have heard of Dali? Okay, so I have two links here. Um, this is Dali Mini because Dali is hosted or was invented by OpenAI and it's hosted on OpenAI and it's not free. So you need to use credits. But there is a mini version of Dali hosted at Hugging Face, which is again a repository for uh, machine learning models. You can use Dali Mini for free. And if you want to get into the code behind how it's trained and how the inference pipeline is deployed, and if you're proficient with Python, there's a link here that will go to the Python code behind it. So the first link goes to the Dali mini hugging face um, um, site. And the second link goes to a Google Colab notebook where we can actually go to see the code behind how Dali mini works. Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna go to the first one. Okay, so here is, um, Here's Dolly Mini, and give me a prompt, someone. What, what do I want to draw? Okay. Sure. Oh, Salvador Dali? Sure. 
Sure. Oh, yeah, I'm in Tampa. I forgot. <laughs> okay. So, um, yes, that's right. Okay. So, um, this is uh, this, this website is called Hugging Face, and it is a repository for a lot of different machine learning models, which are community driven. And um, for, I think, uh, I don't think for the most part, I think for all of it, it's pretty much free to use. And when we, um, when we use models on here, obviously um, you need to attribute them for, um, for what they're doing. But uh, apart from that, you need to, um, you can test, this is like a playground. So you can test different types of models here. So here is Dali meets Wally for T, which is, uh, there's a bunch of, Images that came up here. So, mm. Well, it got the Wally right. It got the Wally right. Huh. I Oh, well, so that's that's machine learning for you. So <laughs> you're not, it's not deterministic, which is, uh, which is, one of the things that you need to know about machine learning. All right. Um, yes. Very good question. Why is it not deterministic? Well, it's not deterministic because we train it not to be deterministic. And we, do, we train it not to be deterministic because the data that it gets is not represent, it's not 100% representative of the real world. Again. Why can I, I don't know, come for log everywhere, so, and uh, to say, okay, I gave this bunch of data, I received this data, okay, and I have good log, and okay, my, my algorithm go here, 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 and make it good. So why can't it work like this? Okay, I'll give you an example for that, right? Let's give you the example of chess. Very deterministic game, very few moves, right? Okay. Um, have you heard the story of the guy who invented chess? No? Okay, I will tell you. It's a very short story. So the guy who invented chess, um, the king was really happy with him. Very great game. So he asked him, what do you want? Gold, silver. He told me, I don't want anything. Very small reward. He told me, okay, what's your reward? He said, the chess board, for the first square, give me one grain of rice. For the second one, give me two. For the third one, give me four grains of rice. Do you know what happened? Uh, <laughs> there is not enough rice that has been produced on the planet to fill the entire chessboard with that calculation. Yeah. So for even a simple game like chess, the search space that you're talking about, you will, it's impossible to search the entire space of possibilities. And that's the, that's the issue why you will run out of console, you will run out of electricity before you can console log everything. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, I love it when I get the chance to bring up the chess. <laughs> okay. So if you wanna see how the DALI works, you can go to the second link, which is the second QR code here. And that will, if you're um, familiar with Python, will bring you up to the inference pipeline of DALI. So this is Google Colab. So um, when you run Google Colab, um, you, need to connect, um, you need to connect to an environment. And again, um, here it shows how much, uh, or here it shows the connection. And in order to run the notebook, you just go to each cell and there's a play button and you, um, you click the play and it keeps running again. Colab is free to use. There is a pro version of it if you want to run some runtimes which are really high memory, 
or high compute resource, but I'm going to spare you the details. So essentially what you do is you hit play on all of these things at the end. When you go to this part where it says prompts, you put in the sentence you want. So you can put in one, two, like how many ever sentences you want. And ultimately it's going to display all these things to you. Um, this takes about 15 minutes to run because it goes through all the steps one by one by one. And this gives you an under the hood look at how Dali actually works. Okay, um, and finally, I wanna talk about GPT. Um, how many of you guys have heard of GPT-3? GPT-3, very good. So for those of you who haven't heard, GPT-3, when it was first released, uh, it stands for um, Generative Pre-Chain Transformers. Um, it seemed like magic because it was basically a system where you would put in a prompt and the computer would tell you a story. And it, it seemed unbelievable. But then details were released about how they actually made it. What they did is they took the sum knowledge of all the published books in the world, all of Wikipedia, and used all that data to train a model. And then depending on what it saw, it knows sentence structure, it knows word continuity. And I'm gonna show you guys an example of GPT. So I'm gonna show you GPT-2. Again, GPT-3 is not free, but GPT-2 is, and it's stored on Hugging Face. The first, the first link goes to Hugging Face GPT-2. And the second link is again, it's a collab notebook that shows you how it works under the hood. Okay. So when we go to GPT-2, let's, let's start a story for this guy. Once upon a time, once upon a time what? There was, there was a dragon. All right, let's see what it does with a dragon. There was a dragon in the sky, a white fire and a blue stone and three stone, two dragons look with the dragon's head and look, look at each other like they were looking for, and then. So um, depending on what you give it as an input, it tries and generates a coherent output for what follows. So as you can tell, um, this has probably read a lot of storybooks up with dragons in it. And that's how it gets this idea. Again, it's hosted on Hugging Face. If you are interested in generative models, Hugging Face is a very good place where you can find a lot of hosted models. Okay, and uh, this other website is, again, it's a playground that shows you how GPT-2 works. It's also a Google Collab Notebook. And you can run, um, it's, uh, it runs on the previous version of TensorFlow, so I'm not going to spend too much time running on it, but um, you can choose between the small parameters, which is 117 million parameters, or the Excel version that is 1.5 billion parameters um, in order to run this guy. Okay, uh, I think we ran it too much, all right. Very good question. So both of them, are frameworks which are written in Python. Google uh, Research is the author of TensorFlow and Facebook or Meta Research is the author of PyTorch. Both of them use the same kind of architecture to deploy neural networks. However, there are subtle differences between both of them. So there's some things you can do, in, um, do well in TensorFlow that you cannot do that well in PyTorch and vice versa. Um, in general, if you're using Google products, you'll see they stick to TensorFlow. But it's not necessary that they don't use PyTorch. You can use PyTorch in a Google Collab Notebook too. If you use um, OpenAI products, OpenAI usually prefers to use PyTorch um, because there's a historical, um, historical background behind why it was. PyTorch is a, is an offshoot of something called Torch, 
and Torch was an original C and C++ based library and PyTorch is the Python version of it. And the original author, they actually work at Meta AI. Um, so that's... There's no real, it's not really hype. It's, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. So there are a group of researchers who are employed at Meta or Facebook. When they do research, they publish papers, their implementation is first in PyTorch and then people port it to TensorFlow. So usually some new stuff that comes out of Facebook is usually a machine learning stuff is usually in PyTorch. Something that comes out of Google is usually in TensorFlow. So you will see sometimes the excitement is big with PyTorch because very recently some Facebook research has announced something. Next year you might see there's again a big, um, a big uh, excitement about TensorFlow models because there was Google research, they published something in TensorFlow. And it keeps going back and forth. Yeah. Okay, yes. So parameters are not just words or documents. They are things like the average number of words or how many or how frequent is this word. So things about the data are parameters. Um, usually when we, so if you think about the language models, I, I, I believe that's what you're asking about. So in language models, we can't actually put a word inside a neuron and ask it to train it. The, the neuron only understands ones and zeros and numbers, right? So we have to map the words into a numeric value. And so the properties of these numeric values are the parameters that it's trained. Okay? All right, so that was my talk. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope it wasn't too boring and uh, thank you. And any questions, please ask me. Um, feel free to talk to me outside. Um, I'll be here. Yes. So, uh, Python kind of primary way comes from machine learning. So, uh, you saw the uh, number for uh, JavaScript. So, so uh, it depends on other languages, don't have a So, it's not necessary that we are using, we're using Python because it's popular. But, if you want to look at efficiency, for example, the best code to write is in C++. If you're looking at web portability, the best is JavaScript. When I showed you that code in JavaScript, it's basically because you can put it on a website.